Hey there, Groovesters and Groove Stars. Ridgely here with another exciting episode of Lessons from the CEO. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a good friend who's the founder of Spiffy Checkouts and personalbrand.com. We're going to learn a lot from this gentleman, Michael Hunter. Thank you so much for joining us, brother. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. I'm excited, man. I'm excited to hear the story because I know that you started early, early as an entrepreneur and not everybody does, right? Oftentimes people go into the corporate thing for a while and then they work for a company and then maybe somehow they get the bug or whatever. But for you, it was kind of a right out of the gate. So tell us your story, man. How'd you get started? Yeah, I got started in entrepreneurship at 17. Um, I had a a unique opportunity, I guess a unique challenge. The summer between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college was my first summer without sports, decided not to play college football and decided to go get a job. But at 17, your your employment options are limited. So I worked for a family friend who owned a catering company. Um, and then I got a letter in the mail for a direct sales company, commission only. And so I had my first taste of, of the entrepreneurship spirit there where I was working about 15 hours a week at a catering company, making $8 an hour, and then also working my own schedule, setting my own appointments, making my own uh, sales calls and uh, generating my own commissions. And I was working about $8 an hour, 15 hours a week, you know, roughly making $150 a week over there. And on my commission only side, I uh, was making about $1,000 a week as a 17 year old kid. So that was the, the first defining moment on my journey was just seeing how I always wanted to try to capture my effort, my value, uh, you know, based off my own personal efforts rather than, you know, working a job, um, you know, later on, on my senior year of college, uh, this was during the great recession. I saw my, my friends struggling to get jobs out of, out of school. And so I was like, shoot, I'm gonna have to create my own job. Um, and so I jumped right into entrepreneurship again, started my own marketing company, um, and, and created my own job, uh, helping, uh, web, helping small businesses build websites, market automation and, um, and, and generate leads and sales for their small businesses. So um, definitely been on the path of entrepreneurship for a, for a while and have some interesting perspectives and insights on on how to navigate that path, uh, getting started and then growing up, uh, you know, growing into a multi-million dollar business. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Let's go back a little bit because it is interesting, uh, very interesting that you would get to your senior year in college and say, I don't like what's out there. I'm going to create my own thing. How did you get to that mindset that says, I got this, I'm going to trust me, not that big thing out there that most people do? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. And it, it definitely wasn't all uh, sunshine and roses. And I think looking back on that decision, um, it, it possibly possibly was the wrong decision. And it's it's a path that um, you know I wouldn't necessarily advise everyone to take. It's definitely not the easy path. It was right for me, and, and I wouldn't change anything for it. But one of the things that that I coach uh, entrepreneurs that are just getting started too is like don't struggle unnecessarily. And and I definitely struggled unnecessarily. Like it took me years to kind of struggle and and you know uh, trip over myself to find my legs to, to 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 figure out niching down and like doing that all while living off of the income i was generating from a struggling business versus doing it from the strength of having a, a, a nice corporate income and and doing it as a side hustle getting started so again there's there's no right path um but i, I think ultimately especially these days you know the hustle culture go all in follow your dreams there is no plan b um it's less of taking unnecessary risk and unnecessary and struggling unnecessarily versus having the all in mentality and the all in mindset, the no plan B mindset. So, uh, you know, you can be very intentional about, uh, navigating that while also having a career, you know, navigating your entrepreneurial junior and be very strategic with the efforts that you put in without having to take unnecessary risk, uh, personally or for your fan friends, family, financially, all those things. So, um, Happy to, to dive into some concepts and some of my personal story around that too. Yeah, love to, man. And especially because I'm I'm I always wonder, is there a breed of which you and I would likely form part that are the psychologically unemployable? Right. And and because for me, I had one job for 30 days in my entire life. One. 
right? Every other gig was some kind of side hustle or a company that I started. And the concept to me of working to build somebody else's dream doesn't make any sense. But if I look back and I say to myself, could I have benefited from six or seven years in the corporate world, going into the military and learning some discipline or some other stuff? The answer is I absolutely could have benefited from that and might be much further along as an entrepreneur today, but I just wasn't, it just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I, I I can completely relate to that. Like while I was in college, I started several companies. Started, you know, this was before the gig economy, before there was the Ubers and the DoorDashes, where you know you could find pockets of time to make revenue. And so I I was very intentional during college, you know, to start like a moving company, putting ads on Craigslist, you know, going in and making cash on the weekends, kind of creating my own gig economy, um, um, and and ultimately, um, the the, the the lessons that I learned uh, by being self sufficient um, might have also constructed a little bit. Hey, hey, sorry, backtracking a little bit. Also during this time, I was very involved in personal development, and I was learning more outside the classroom than I was inside the classroom. Um, I was going to business seminars and learning more in a weekend than I was in an entire semester of business class. And so I during college and this kind of bred that mindset of doing my own thing, starting my own business where, um, you know, I was, I, and I actually said this was I'm, you know, officially unemployable just because I've, I had this entrepreneurial spirit, but, um, to, to pull it back into what you were saying too, um, you know, having that, I personally had that mindset, um, of, of thinking that going and getting a job was selling out on my entrepreneurial dream when it was actually the best thing that I could have done. And I actually did it. So after a few years of building my marketing agency, uh, becoming an Infusionsoft partner now called Keep, um, Keep actually recruited me to join their marketing team. And I had a defining moment in my life where I had a, you know, I was at a part point where I could take a job at a fast growing startup software company um, and take a pay cut. And to me, that was taking a step backwards. But I also understood that it wasn't just taking a job anywhere. It was taking a job where whether I was there for 12 months, uh, you know, two years, five years, that after I left, I'd have a different level of credibility and it would actually help me get to my green, my dreams faster than I would just going on the path that I was on because it wasn't wasn't working the way that I, I had thought it would at, at, at the start. So um, ultimately... Yeah. Let me dive into that for a second because yeah. that's a... That's a very mature perspective at quite a young, early age in your entrepreneurial journey. So how did you get to that? Because I wish I'd have been as smart as you. I was like, damn the torpedoes. I'm going and I'm just going to do this my way or or I'm hitting the highway because I, I just and, and you know, I, I've started now 45 companies, Michael, of which two or three were successful, three or four were moderately successful, and the rest were highly educational, as in they all failed. So when I look at the failure to success ratio in my own background, it's like one out of five, one out of seven, maybe, actually worked. And But you took, you had the foresight to say, wait, if I take this thing over here, it's going to get me further down the line at an early age, man. I didn't have that kind of wisdom. How'd you got, how'd that, how'd that process for you? Um, you know, I've, I've always been, been quite self-aware of, of how my actions today can, can be perceived in the future. Um, you know, for instance, I, I didn't drink alcohol until I was 26, um, for several different reasons, but I was very involved in sports. I was always looking for the competitive edge. Um, and it was, you know, down to nutrition and health benefits was, was the main reason. Um, and even after I turned 21, after I stopped playing sports, again, I wanted to have, you know, a sharp mind, I want to have a competitive edge. Um, and I wanted to build a reputation, you know, especially in college, you know, you're, you know, most people drink with all their buddies and you kind of develop these personas. Well, while all my friends were drinking at parties, I was networking in business communities. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know why I just had this like inclination to be very future focused. And, uh, this concept of, of what I described as has played out in my life a couple different times. 
And I've distilled it into a principle called moving in 45 degree angles. Um, you know, a lot of times you have these, uh, you know, gurus, mentors, whatever out there talking about having a crystal clear vision, burn the boats, go at all costs. But, and, and, and a lot of that energy and the ethos of that is valid. And sometimes the direct route isn't the fastest path. Sometimes taking the scenic route is actually the fastest way to get there. So the direct path might be through mountains and across chasms and rivers and alligators where there's just this really nice road that's the, the long way, um, but can actually get you there faster with less pain and less struggle. And so that's where I call moving in 45 degree angles. It's like you, you have a vision of where you're going, but you can see how moving over to the left in a 45 degree angle over to the right in a 45 degree angle uh, can actually get you there faster. And that was the mentality that um, I had with taking that job at Infusionsoft. Again, it wasn't any job. It was a job that was going to add credibility to me moving forward. I have this I have this awareness because I was running my marketing agency and I was losing clients to people who worked at Infusionsoft formally that knew less about marketing than I did. Just the fact that they said that they worked at Infusionsoft back in the day um, you know, was, was credibility. And so you know, I was losing deals and like, shoot, like, okay, if I just go get a job at Infusionsoft, hypothetically, um, that's going to add more credibility and I'm going to get bigger, better clients. And that's exactly what happened. I was at Infusionsoft for 16 months. When I left, went back to my marketing company, joined forces with my now business partner, Jeremy Abraham. And we started working with bigger and bigger clients um, and ended up working with household names like Brendan Burchard and Oprah and uh, Larry King and you know having a lot of success. And a lot of that was based off of that decision to put, check my ego, take an action, which I felt at the time was very much taking a step back, but also having the foresight and the vision to see how I'd be able to move forward faster. I love that. That's so cool, man. So if you if you wanted to distill it down, and say, what are, in your mind, the top several characteristics, top couple of characteristics of a successful entrepreneur, what would those be? I would say having vision and having an insane work ethic. I think both those two things are critically important. Um, especially, the, you know, I, I'd say today the, world entre- the word entrepreneur has become a buzzword. And... Um, entrepreneurship is really about recognizing trends and seeing what innate desires people have and innovating, creating, developing products to fulfill the needs of the marketplace, solving problems. Um, and, and there's this kind of, there's, there's this beautiful balance of, of, uh, both creativity and intention, um, you know, abstract and structure that, that, form a great entrepreneur, someone that can think outside the box, but also has a little bit of that engineering brain to also create systems. Um, And so, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily have both of those skill sets out of the gates, but I would say that those are are two things that uh, make a great entrepreneur, somebody that can be creative and be systems oriented. Yeah, that's right. I think that's exactly right. Um, it, It, and almost um you can get so far as a creative person but to really get to any significant level you have to have systems there's no way to get there because you can't scale right yeah exactly there's there's a lot of successful entrepreneurs that hit high six figures maybe low seven figures but in order to build a truly lasting sustainable profitable business that scales well into the seven figures or beyond, uh, it's much more important to get good at building systems than it is to be good at getting at, at making sales. Yeah. Yeah. Even though both are important, I at the end of the day, you just can't scale unless you've got some SOPs that make some sense yeah. uh, and that they're usable. I love the way that uh, I happen to be a big fan of Michael Gerber's. And when he talks about in the E-Myth, he talks about it's not extraordinary people that build an extraordinary company it's a lot of ordinary people doing ordinary things in an extraordinary way i'm like okay dude i'm in like let's make it let's get it down so so simple that ordinary people can do any part of this you can just plug them in never easy but man what the payoff is just huge 
So love this question. Tell us about a an error, a setback, could be colossal or could be just something that really strikes you uh, that you've endured in your business career and what you took away from that. Oh man. I know luckily, it, yeah. I mean, luckily I've I've avoided a lot of colossal setbacks. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but there's there's lots of small setbacks. I would say over uh you know over my career as as an entrepreneur there's been been times where uh you know sometimes my communication wasn't where it needed to be and um where my my level of urgency and my excitement um outweighed possibly you know my i didn't have the full perspective of of everything that was on my clients plates and so um you know, I would say ultimately some mistakes that I've made is is really about you know ultimately coming down to you know communication and showing up in a a, a way of service and and gratitude and um, and understanding versus always be having the type A let's go 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 like why are we hitting missing deadlines and things of that nature you know both with with clients and and team um, uh, as far as catastrophic errors. Um, you know, there's there's no right or, or wrong way. I mean, we've made some interesting choices, and and they've they've actually worked out very well. Um, but we've made some hard choices of like not following the path that everyone else is following, just for the sake of following the path that everyone else is following. So, you know, when you're building a software company, most people raise money, and most people think that they need to raise money in order to get started on their idea. And we actually, uh, to this day. Um, you know, we're five, six years in have bootstrapped spiffy checkouts. Um, and you know, we're at a eight figure valuation at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had potential ac acquisition conversations already with some of our dream companies and have lots of people who have wanted to invest. And up until this point, we've said no. And so, um, I would say, uh, it's it's definitely not a lesson from from a mistake necessarily, but like an interesting lesson um, that you know just don't don't follow the path that everyone's following just because everyone's followed that path <laughs> and and very very much get clear on you want on what what you want. Um, I think a lot of times we forget that why we're building a business is is for. Um, for the lifestyle that we want to create. And um, I, I, I think ultimately the biggest mistake that I've, I've made is, um, is having, is, is thinking that like the house and the car and the material things were the things that were going to make me happy rather than enjoying the journey along the way. And I had, a, I did have a moment where I had the house, I had the car, had the beautiful wife, and I wasn't happy, and uh, because my business wasn't where I wanted it to be, and uh, I had a moment, and I was like, okay, at this point, you know, my house—it it was a nice house. It wasn't like a crazy fancy house, right? But it was like, okay, I see now that a bigger house isn't going to make me more happy. A, a nicer car isn't going to make me more happy, and it was a big reframe around all of that to operating my business out of service, being helpful. And showing up every single day, out of what can I do for other people versus, uh, you know, focusing on on where where I'm at personally. And Jen Rome has that has that famous quote. You know, it's like if you help another people get what they want, you'll ultimately get what you want. Um, yeah. And so that's been been something that, you know, I heard that quote when I was 17, but that quote resonates and has more more and deeper meaning to me now than it ever has, and that's my focus. Yeah, I love that, man. You know, I work very, very closely with Jim. I did not. No, that's awesome. No, let me show you. I, I got something right here. Uh, I'll pull it down here for you and I will show you. So this is Seasons of Life, one of my favorite okay. books of all time by Jim Rohn. And there's us because oh, I, wow. I was Jim's voice in Spanish. No way. So all of Jim's books, if you want to buy a Jim Rohn book right now in, in, in Spanish, it's going to be in my voice. Uh, I traveled all over Latin America with Jim. He was my mentor for two years. It was amazing. Wow. That's amazing. That's it's so super, cool. Yeah, it really was. Yeah, it was <laughs> one, of the, one of the great prides of my life is hanging out with Jim Rohn a lot. And, um, and to that point, 
how has mentorship impacted your entrepreneurial journey? Um, I mean, mentorship is, is really everything. And, um, I think one of the things that I longed for was an in-person mentor in my life. Um, and I've had several, um, but I've also discounted the impact that mentors have had on my life through books, through audio, through video. Um, and I've just been a, a, a student of personal development. I've been a student of business and marketing. Um, and it's, it's one of my core values is, is continual learning. And, uh, you know, people like Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins, Brendan Burchard, uh, on the personal development side and, and on the business side, um, I've definitely shaped me as a human and, and played a cr- critical role on all of that. And I think through my path as an entrepreneur, like my first business mentor, one of my key lessons I learned there was like, he had all the business success. And then once I got to know him on a personal level, it's like, man, he doesn't have the personal life that I want. And so it's kind of making sure that the mentors that you look up to have the full package. And I think, um, you know, especially throughout my career, finding people that are, have closer and closer and closer to the business success and the personal success that I want, but ultimately realizing that, uh, you know, there really isn't a, a single mentor out there that has exactly what I want and, and, and recognizing that not placing any one person on a pedestal and taking bits and pieces from different people based in their own domain and realizing that we are here to be our own leaders and to become that mentor that we were always seeking for. And so that's, that's one of my missions is, um, you know, always giving credit or credits due to, to the people that helped me get to where I'm at and also becoming that mentor and that, that person that I was always seeking for. Yeah, for sure. Couldn't agree more, man. Tangential to mentorship. What's your take on ongoing personal and professional development, the need to continue that journey reading, listening, watching, attending, hanging out with, et cetera. Yeah. I think Jim Rohn said it best, you know, re- recommended daily personal developments, like taking a shower, recommended daily, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's something that like I said, it, it, personal growth and personal development is, is something that is one of my core values. It's something that I dedicate time to every single day, every single week, invest in heavily have for the last 15 plus years. Um, and also I would venture out to say also spiritual development. I think there's a point where, uh, you, you've read all of the books, you've been to all the seminars and it's less about going out and finding more information and reaching more understanding and reaching an understanding and going within and, and really owning your gifts, your talents, your mission, your purpose here on earth and, and really finding confidence. And I think it's both. It's like having the, uh, uh, I don't know who invented this concept, um, but it's the, the confidence competence loop. You have to go out there, do the learning, find the understanding, build the skill set to have the competence and that competence builds confidence. And once you kind of have that confidence competence loop, um, then it's more so about showing up in a big way and taking steps towards your bigger mission and purpose. Yeah, for sure, man. I guess so with you on that. That confidence, confidence loop is just so critical. And you you just get good at something and then it gives you the confidence and then you keep on going and you do whatever. For me, that's been my AI journey, man. I got in a little bit late compared to some people, but just when it was becoming more easy for the average human to kind of do it. And now... I have this t- challenge for myself that every single day I try to do something different. And I've been doing it pretty much all year this year. So almost a full year. And it's like amazing how you start to get confident. Like I, I, I run an AI mastermind and I say to my guys, I'm like, I don't care what you need. Bring it. Let's go. What you got? What you got? What you need? I got you. I don't care what it is. Sales letter, email sequence, blog post, market, website thing. Just bring it. What you got? Who's going to bring me something I can't do? Let's see. Right. And then, but that, it wasn't like that six months ago. I guarantee you that. Right. 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 So talk to us uh, 
about your take on AI. What do you think AI is doing to us? What What do you think the future looks like? How is it going to impact business and especially entrepreneurs and especially those who might take advantage of it early in the cycle of acceptance? Yeah, it's 100% the future. I think currently, like any new thing, there's a lot of hype around it that may not be reinforced. So there's a lot of misunderstanding as far as what the where the technology is at currently today. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be taking it seriously. We shouldn't be learning it. You know, exactly what you said, just playing with it every single day. Developing that skill set is 100% the future. It's going to have a massive disruption in the world of business, uh, in the workforce, in the workplace. And it's going to make humans more effective. And that's going to be the new economy is getting more output for the input for each employee. And so if you want to be a valuable employee or a valuable entrepreneur or you know, a valuable founder, it's very important that you have an understanding yourself and that you hire people that have an understanding. And if you want to differentiate yourself in the workforce to essentially be superhuman because you have an understanding of how to leverage AI to do many different things and implement many different skill sets where formerly maybe they had to hire five or six different entry level people but through the power of AI they can hire one higher level person that can do uh, you know have you know through through technology have a bigger impact so I, I don't think it's the downfall of society necessarily um, I think it, there's definitely some you know scary aspects of of what could happen in the future um, but I I definitely believe that uh, it is something that will be a force for good in the world and just like the internet was something that was disruptive. It created marketplaces that we marketplaces, ideas, businesses that we couldn't even comprehend in the late eighties and nineties. And I think that's going to be very much the case with AI too. Yeah, me too. I'm with you hundred percent. That's exactly what I think. And uh, I do think it's one of those things, like you said, that getting more output from the input is everything that AI is about to me. It's one of those, wow, man, what used to take me two weeks now takes me 25 minutes. Yep. Hold on, let's back up here a second. What else could we potentially do? And how can we position ourselves ahead of what looks like a tsunami coming? Yeah, and totally. To I, I see it very much as that. You know, there's there's a quote, uh, and forgive me, I, I, I don't know who said it, but you know, what's the most expensive real estate in the world? And it's the graveyard, right? It's like all the ideas that went with humans that were never implemented. And I think AI is one of those tools that's actually going to extract human potential to its full, fullest capability that we've ever seen. And so for, when, when you look at it from that perspective, uh, you know, all of the ideas, all of, all of the things that were world-changing ideas, but maybe people didn't have the confidence or resources to implement or execute, I, I see AI as be playing a critical role in in bringing human human potential, materializing human potential, and bringing ideas to reality, and that's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, you know, man, it's it's interesting because I've I've written uh, maybe we may have talked about this, but I've written twenty books so far, and um, when three point five ChatGPT three point five came out, I was like, okay, this is good, but it's not as good as me. Now I have relinquished that view. <laughs> I am done with that. If prompted properly, AI writes better than I do. Okay. So just like, okay, man, now we can take the output and maybe tweak it and make it more personal, more genuine, more thing, more whatever. But I can't do what AI can do. I can't do it in as much time as I wanted, never mind the fraction of the time that it takes to do stuff on AI. It's crazy. So it's been one of those, okay, man, you better be paying attention here because if you ain't paying attention, you're done. You just may as well retire, call it a day, and just start collecting Social Security or something. You know <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, so love this, this question right here. You have all the experience and wisdom of this entrepreneurial journey that started at 17. If you could go back... 15, 20, 25, doesn't matter what the number is, 20 years, call 20, and talk to the young Michael of 20 years ago 
and tell them based on what you now know and the experience that you now have, what would you want to say to him? And oh, by the way, hey, man, I wouldn't change anything. That's not an acceptable answer. OK, <laughs> we're, we're, we're just throwing that one out. What would you say to young Mike? Um, That's a good question. Let me think about that for a second. Yeah, no worries, man. That, that's why I like throwing this question out there, because it's kind of like you got to kind of ponder that for a minute. What is the most important thing I would want to share with that younger me if I had all that I know now? Um, so I, I would I would share to read more and focus on connections earlier um focus on on relationships cultivating relationships finding relationships to invest in um reading more not necessarily reading more books but finding a handful of books to study and know intimately i've i am very well read and i think there is this constant feeling that I need to know more. I need to read more. I need to do all these things versus intimately knowing certain concepts and principles that are the foundation of success. Um, one, one thing that, I, that it's a pattern in my life is overthinking things and overcomplicating things, keeping things simple. I would tell myself to keep things simple. Um, and I would tell myself to stick by my guns and and stick to what I know is right. I think that's one thing that I've I've recognized throughout my entire life is that we're all figuring things out. And maybe I, I grew up in a little sheltered uh, capacity or something, but you know, I, and it might be a, a a byproduct of our education system. You go through school and you think that doctors and lawyers and chiropractors and dentists, you know, the whole world is just already figured out. Everyone has the answers. The whole world's been explored. You know, you learn about all these explorers finding new lands. You're like, okay, well, there's nothing to explore. But then you actually find that like. There's still so much we don't know. And and so I think um, I would go back and tell myself to be a lot more curious, to be a lot more, um, um, interested in, in finding opportunities and understanding that, uh, you know, even the way that we, we look at the world today, there's still, there's still so much we don't know and, and, uh, diving into, diving into the unknowns and, and the compelling things, um, that, uh, you know, that, that, that I've been passionate about. And, you know, it took me a long time to figure out what I was passionate about. Um, but, uh, ultimately through mentors, through studying and reading and through, um, kind of having more ownership over what I wanted my path to be in my life would, would be kind of three different areas where I would coach myself on. Yeah. Love that, man, for sure. And that's great. Curiosity is like a superpower, man. It really is. It's <laughs> one of my good friends, Anthony Balduzzi, like he's so good in conversations about being so curious. You know, someone says something, he asks a clarifying question and like, it always blows me away how, how curious he is. And it's something that I'm uh, building a skill set to, uh, to be more curious on every single day. Nice. Love that. All right, brother. So three resources, three books, resources that you would recommend for the budding entrepreneur that can help them on their journey to get to the next level. Um, what would they be? Um, studying the book, think and grow rich, not just reading it once, but reading it once a year. Um, and my, my advice would, would very diff, very different, would vary and differ based off of where someone wants to go. But um, I would definitely plug in to uh, any local business organization, develop local business connections, and also in your area of expertise, in your industry, join a national networking mastermind association um, and, uh, and, and build relationships with people that can shortcut your learning curve. Um, so, uh, and then the third one would be um, focusing on 
your own personal health and well-being um, is something that I sacrifice quite a bit. Um, carving out that time to, you know, either hire a nutritionist, hire a personal trainer, possibly, you know, you can find someone that's a, a two for one. Um, but really that side of, of human performance and entrepreneurship is something that, um, is critically important. I used to think that, you know, taking a walk in the park was like the least productive thing I can do. And I've actually found that it's the most productive thing I could do just before this interview, I, I went on a two mile run, you know, and, um, you know, that, that was the thing that for me added more clarity in my mind, got my energy up, allowed me to focus and, uh, feel like I accomplished something today too. So yeah. You know what's cool, man? So get this. Uh, I didn't realize this until I read a book called Walking with Nietzsche. Mm. And Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, I found out that some of the greatest world philosophers were all walkers, like major walkers, the mountain walking, trail walking, etc. And as I dove into this, I learned that actually the methodical walking releases a certain ability to think clearly and to reason processes in your own mind that naturally leads to the ability to come up with big thoughts, big ideas. So there's actually, not only is it true that many of the great philosophers of the world, the Nietzsche's and more, Kant, uh, John Dewey, you know, those kind of people, not only is there did they were they walkers there's biological evidence scientific evidence that it's actually really good for your brain to do that so i wow. thought I'd that with you kind of cool right yeah i need to buy that book cuz i mean the last 2 or 3 years i've been very i get a lot of my ideas and and a lot of my meditation comes when i'm on my runs yeah. um and, and running and so um very fascinating I, i'm i'm picking up that book right now I'm gonna. It's called Walking with Nietzsche. I'm looking for it here. I, unfortunately, I'm like you, man. I have so many books. You say, well, where's Walking with Nietzsche? Well, it's on one of those shelves over there, man. Right <laughs> next to Patrick Lancioni and Jim Collins and whoever else I got over there. But walk with. I'll, I'll send you the the author for sure. I'll, I'll make sure I get that to you. Cool. All right, brother. Thank you so much for all your time, man. Final words, Michael Hunter, to the world of the entrepreneurs. What would you want to leave us with? Man, it's a it's a big task there. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I think that especially today, our society and uh, you know the platforms that have our attention, it's easy to get complacent and and wrapped up in comparison syndrome, and it's easy to think that everyone has everything figured out because that's what we're looking at every single day on social media. Um, you know and real reality TV shows. And we just have to have a, a very sobering perspective that we're looking at everyone's highlight reels. We're looking at the images people want us to see. And so my biggest message is to get started, take the next step. Um, and it's, it's by doing something and walking through a door where another door will open and even if what even if the next step isn't your ultimate calling, um, you know it's 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 doing the work, doing the reps that help you find the awareness and find the understanding of what your ultimate purpose is in life. Um, and um, one of my big lessons in my life is around the concept of patience, <laughs> you know, and and that word is such a simple word. And at least for me growing up, you know, as a kid, like your parents, Hey, you know, Michael, be patient, like sit down, be quiet, like just go over there and sit over there. That was like, to me, my level of my, my understanding of patience was kind of like, just sit back, wait. And so I had to redefine patience to, cause to me it meant complacency. And then, so I have this very, um, you know, like, like patience is something that, that is a spiritual practice for me and, and I've reframed it and I want to leave this with everyone. Patience isn't complacency. Patience is doing the work in silence when no one's looking to be ready for the opportunity when it comes and, and not forcing things, but doing the work so that when your opportunity comes, you are ready for it. You're confident. Um, and so patience is not a passive thing. It's a very active thing. Um, and it's something that I believe is the key to being a successful entrepreneur, successful partner, 
and a successful human. Thank you very much. Couldn't agree more. That's just so great. And a lesson, that patience thing. I think a lot of us could take a page off that book, brother. (laughs) Michael, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, your insights. Deeply appreciate it. On behalf of the entire community, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Really, really deeply appreciate uh, everything you shared with us and wishing you nothing but immense success and fortune as you move on, my man. Thank you, Ridgely. Appreciate the opportunity to, to share with your audience and hopefully we'll do this again soon. You bet.